Right, three o'clock. Um, good afternoon, distinguished pediatricians and colleagues. Uh, we want to formally welcome you to our July 2020 meeting. And today we have um, one of our colleagues who is not a pediatrician, but has a lot of interest in managing pediatric uh, patients. I was going to say clients, but uh, let me use patients. I think that would be more appropriate. Uh, Dr. Wale Olaride from the UK, who is going to talk to us today. Uh, our moderator today is Dr. Kunle Ayoride, whom most of us know. He has presented to us before, and uh, he would introduce Dr. Wale Olaride appropriately. And in our usual tradition, we just want to allow the chairman of this occasion to say one or two words before we start. Over to you, sir, Dr. Mugala Jilawa. Yeah, so thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Eletu. Uh, it's nice to see everyone again. Uh, in particular, I'm very pleased to uh, meet Dr. Olaninde for the first time. Uh, and I thank Dr. Ayoni Day for his continuing interest in our, in our group. Um, as we have discussed, I, I can see Dr. Ajeni Fuja has joined. Um, you are very welcome, sir. And also Professor Grange, uh, you are also very welcome, ma. Um, a lot of other people have joined, both from diaspora. I welcome everyone uh, who has joined so far. Um, we, we have interesting uh, lecture today on uh, pediatric ENT. And it's, it's an area where many pediatricians uh, really could benefit. So I'm very, very happy that we have this program today. And by the way, we have uh, an interesting lineup uh, during this summer. Our next meeting is going to be on uh, medical equipment and uh, how to use uh, solar power and all of that. Um, it's going to be very interesting and followed Following that, in September, uh, we have, you know, a, a, an interesting session coming up on uh, on clinical governance. Oh, and so, you know, so I, I really look forward to, to all of this, and I want to thank everyone for your suggestions. Uh, I keep getting inputs from everybody um, about how we can do things, uh, what and what we can do on this platform, and um, we are taking note of them and addressing them one by one. Uh, in fact, the upcoming lecture on clinical governance is to address one of the concerns that have been raised uh, in this group. That is, you know, how do you, um, where you delegate clinical responsibilities as a pediatrician, when you delegate clinical responsibilities to your subordinates, how do you ensure uh, that the responsibilities are carried out according to your own uh, guidelines. Uh, obviously, you will have your own operating procedures and all of that. But how do you check to make sure that it's being done accordingly? So it's one of those things that we hope that we'll address when we have the session on clinical governance um, in September. Uh, we have an expert on it to address us. So I'm very happy to welcome everyone again and to just ask that please, um, let's keep the ideas coming. If you think that there's any topic that is going to be very beneficial, <clears throat> please let us know. And if you know any resource person that can help to uh, deliver on those things, please also let us know. So on that note, I welcome the speaker and the chair, uh, the chair person for today again. And I thank you all for coming. Over to you, Dr. Elitu. Thank you very much, sir. So without wasting time, I'll ask, I'll hand over to the moderator, Dr. Kunle Ayoridi. Kunle, over to you. Thank you. Um, once again, it, it's my great pleasure to join you on this forum. And um, I can see and will also acknowledge um, colleagues and friends, uh, senior colleagues, um, former teachers of mine. And it, it's, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be with you once again. Um, it's also an honor to introduce to you the speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Wale Olarindi, who's not only um, your speaker this afternoon, but he's also a friend 
and we happen to work in the same hospital. Uh, so primarily he works in the same hospital that I do, which is the Chesterfield Royal Hospital in the United Kingdom. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, uh, Wally. He is a graduate of the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan. And um, one of the interesting things about when we then happen to uh, meet up and join up working together in the same hospital is that uh, um, somehow we discovered, perhaps not surprisingly, that the names Olarindi and Ayurindi seem to be uh, very familiar. And I occasionally would receive his um, internal um, correspondence and vice versa would, might be the case also. So it was a standing joke for quite a while. Um, now, professionally, Wale undertook general surgical training in London and in the Midlands in the UK. He trained in the highly competitive field of ENT surgery in Yorkshire. And anyone who knows, it's not easy to, uh, to get into training in ENT. So he has excelled and distinguished himself in that particular field. Um, he was appointed as a consultant in air, nose and throat, as well as head and neck surgery at the Chesterfield Royal Hospital in 2010. And he's currently the clinical lead for ENT surgery. Um, he is best described as a general ENT surgeon with a specialist interest in head and neck cancers, including thyroid and parathyroid surgery. Um, while he also works at the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield uh, in the cancer um, service and does a on call um, at the Sheffield Children's Hospital. He is an examiner for the Royal College of Surgeons and has lectured at ENT Masterclass in the UK, in Europe, and also in South Africa. Um, he's not simply a diaspora um, clinician. He does uh, surgical mission work within the West African College of Surgeons, where he has attended in Liberia, in Togo, in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Cameroon, in Burkina Faso, the Gambia, Senegal, and Nigeria, through which he has maintained links with the ENT community in West Africa. Um, now, this is where it gets a bit political. You see, while he describes himself unapologetically to be an Arsenal supporter, Porter. I know Saint Day later won't be pleased with that. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure that he will bring some of the enthusiasm of an Arsenal fan to the discussion this afternoon. I'm sure that he's got a very tasty menu for us this afternoon. And um, he will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we'll take some questions. Um, please keep the chat active, and I'm sure there'll be questions and uh, things we can pick from there, which will generate discussions later on. Um, Without you, I will now hand over to, uh, to, to, to Wally. Thank you, over to you, Wally. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Oh yeah, I can see that you can hear me. So I would share my presentation um, and just move that aside. And great. So yes, um, as introduced, my name is Wally Olaride and I work in Chatfield and Sheffield. Um, I, I'm going to try to share some common ENT conditions. I mean, I don't think I can go through all of them in 45 minutes. Um, just, and I would also share some of my experience um, in the mission work, as um, Dr. Ayuridi has rightly mentioned, um, in West Africa. Some thoughts and then some resources, which you may be well aware of, but I think resources that I think are pretty important to share with you. These are the things I'm going to go through. I will talk about neck thumps, recurrent tonsillitis, obstructive sleep apnea, um, a few air conditions, um, nosebleeds, and breathing difficulties. Um, so I'll start off with cervical lymph nodes. As we know, these um, are pretty, this is a pretty common condition. Okay. This is a pretty common condition um, and sometimes maybe the only sign of an underlying um, problem. Um, by and large, most lymph nodes would probably be reactive, but you've got the hyperplastic ones, um, patients with HIV, which I'm sure a lot of you would be well aware, 
well aware, um, nothing, not something not to be ignored. And then you've got the granulomas, which would be probably common, uh, particularly the mycobacterial ones. Um, in the climate in which I work, we see a fair number of atypical bacterial, uh, mycobacterial infections, toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and all the um, chronic granulomatous diseases. It's interesting to note that probably about 12 up to 12%, sometimes even more of these lymph nodes may be neoplastic and sometimes up to two thirds of them may be lymphomas. I'm sure, you know, the Burkitt's lymphomas in your, you know, in, in West Africa, pretty not unusual. And I'm, the big challenge is getting to diagnose them as quickly as possible so they can get the treatment that they need. Um, so a few basics. Um, the history, how long it's been going on, um, if there are any associated infections, whether these lumps are growing fast, whether they're multiple, whether there are any constitutional symptoms like bone pains, fevers, night sweats, weight loss, you know, failure to thrive. Um, and then the examination, um, where is it? You know, supraclavicular lymph nodes, posterior triangle lymph nodes, probably more likely to be something to be concerned about how big they are. Um, so generally, um, if they're smaller than two centimeters, they're probably not going to be pathological. If they're bigger than two, three centimeters, they might be. Their consistency, are they rubbery? Are they firm? Are they hard? And then other lymph nodes in the neck or other lymph nodes in other parts of the body and organomegaly. I'm sure a lot of you would have the routine bloods you do, probably full blood counts, ESR, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. One of the things I really want to push a little bit here is the ultrasound scan. And the big question I ask there is, do you have a reliable sonographer? Now, many times you might send for an ultrasound scan and you'll get a report like this. And I don't know how you feel when you get this. It says there are multiple lymph nodes on both sides, measuring two to four centimeters, normal salivary glands, normal thyroid glands, no compressive symptoms. And what I feel when I see a report like that is, well, I know that. Um, and what I really want to know is, are these lymph nodes pathological or not? Now, this has made a big difference um, in my oncology practice, because to a large extent, the people who do our ultrasound scans can tell me whether the lymph nodes they're looking at are pathological or not. And that's a real game changer. And where I want to push here is a thought, you know, as pediatricians, would you consider training in ultrasonography? I mean, gynecologists do, and they do it quite a lot. And I understand the fact that, you know, they've got lots of patients who um, do need scans, um, but it's something that probably um, we can also think about. A lot of head and neck surgeons in ENT have trained in ultrasonography, I haven't. But I think just to simply answer that very clear question, are these lymph nodes pathological or not? It just might be something to think about. And I'll say one or two things more about that in a minute. Another game changer with um, diagnosis of lymph nodes is the fine needle aspiration or the core needle biopsy. Now, I would presume that you would probably find more lymph node biopsies, um, but there is probably a lot that can be done to prevent the number of lymph node biopsies that we do and change it to core needle biopsies. So in my cancer practice, for example, we don't do that many fine needle aspirations. It's mainly core needle biopsies where we get a core of tissue, send it off to the, path to the pathologist. Sometimes we might just cut a little bit off and send it off to microbiology. A few things about management, a lot of these patients will probably get some empirical antibiotics because that does help you to decide to some extent whether these lymph nodes are anything to worry about or not. Usually once you've made that impression that they're nothing to worry about, it's reassurance. We know that probably up to two thirds, probably even 75% of children would have lymph nodes that are just normal. Um, but if they're pathological, of course, we then treat the underlying cause. Um, and a few, little bit more about this issue of core needle biopsy. So with a lymph node biopsy, you most likely require general anesthetic, you need a surgeon, you need an anesthetist, and there's probably a little bit of morbidity that goes with it. So if it's a lymph node, the posterior triangle, there's a risk to the spinal accessory nerve, which causes significant morbidity, that's a scar. And definitely in your climb, the cost is a big issue here. Whereas with a core needle biopsy, what you need is a monopty needle Emla cream, because we're talking about children here. So Emla cream over a very wide area where you're probably going to do the biopsy and some lignocaine injection. And they've just got a little bit of a little, a few biopsy needles there. 
Um, and this is something now, it's probably not well documented, but this is something that can be done in children. It may be a little bit tricky, but definitely possible, particularly if you've got Emla cream and lignocaine on board. Now, I would submit, yes, it may be difficult in children below the age of six, seven, eight, but once the child is getting a bit older and you can get to talk to them, there's a fair chance that you may be able to get this done um, compared to having to do a lymph node biopsy with all that goes with it there. So something to think about. Um, so just a few clinical predictors. So I've talked about size, superclavicular lymph nodes, um, a history of malignancy previously, particularly lymphomas and things like that. So either lymph node biopsy or a core needle biopsy, like I said, most of the time, or I would say probably 90, 95% of the time, what your histopathologist can find on a lymph node biopsy, they probably would also find on a core needle biopsy. So the duration of the symptoms, and we talked about some of these constitutional symptoms, and these are sometimes quite useful to help you to decide um, if these lymph nodes are anything to worry about or not. And the big thing I've talked about is ultrasound scan. So ultrasound scan is so important. And I'll, I'll come to another thing about it is building teams and things like so. Even if you know you're not terribly keen on training ultrasonography, building teams and getting a reliable sonographer is just so, so important. And you're only going to get this if you go around and talk to the people that actually do these scans. A chest x-ray, full blood count, ESR, these are probably your baseline investigations. And then serology, a lot of the time, um, helps to prevent unnecessary surgery, um, particularly when it's one of these conditions that probably just needs the appropriate treatment. Um, Ultrasonography again, these two guys um, work in my in the hospital where I work at, Kit Chow and David Andrew. Um, and like I said, they've made a big difference to, you know, helping to decide whether. So we've got a neck lump clinic, patients come in, we take a history, send them off an ultrasound scan, and it, they, they more or less, I would say 95, 97% of the time, they can tell us if a lymph node is pathological um, or not. There is a resource there um, and head and neck ultrasound scans. So one of the guys that does a lot of ultrasound scans in the United Kingdom is a guy in Swansea, um, where I did a lat training several years ago. Um, that resource is brilliant. It talks, you know, there are lots of different presentations on there about setting up a service, about where you can get training, about courses that you can go for. So that's a pretty good resource um, on there. And that's why I've put that there. One brief word about atypical mycobacterium. Um, I don't know how common it is in West Africa or Nigeria, not uncommon here. This is present precisely what you get. You get this slightly scary looking lump and it looks like, oops, that needs to be dealt with very quickly. The big game changer about this is the child is remarkably well for what you see. Um, those are some of the causative organisms there. They have a normal chest x-ray. They don't have your typical TB. Um, and usually these patients get better with a combination of antibiotics. They, I think the jury, the jury is out as to which exactly is the best. Um, we use clarithromycin and superfloxacin, but most of the time you're going to have to use them for more than about three months. Many times an incision and drainage only delays things and only makes matters worse. Um, usually most of the time not indicated. If it's on the face, because one of the common areas where you can get this is probably on the face in the parotid region, probably you might think about a wide, wide local excision just to prevent um, facial disfigurement somewhere down the line. But most of the time, these actually just resolve with a curse of antibiotics. And so they look like this, they, they're described as a violaceous looking lump. And the big thing here is that these patients are usually quite well. They're playing around, they're absolutely fine. So other lumps, um, you get the you get the thyroglossal thyroglossal duct cysts. Um, once again, can be diagnosed clinically. And um, so I don't know whether you can see my cursor, but usually up in the upper part of the neck, in the midline. Um, usually, once the patient opens their mouth and sticks the tongue out, it moves with tongue protrusion. And I always teach people and say, 
Um, it's very important not that they stick out their tongue at the same time. It's best that they open the mouth first, stick the tongue out. If it moves, it's very, very likely to be a thyroglossal dog cyst. Do they have to be removed? Not necessarily. If they're not causing any problems, they can be left alone. But there is always that risk that they can cause infections, particularly when these patients get upper respiratory tract infections. Dermoids would be your other differential because they'll be exactly in the same place in the midline, but not deep. You've got your thyroid swellings, which would be in the lower part of the neck, and then submandibular gland swellings, which would be either parotid gland swellings or submandibular gland swellings. They definitely need to be referred to somebody surgical because many times they may be pathological. Branchial anomaly is quite um, uncommon. Um, I saw this young boy um, in Morovia in February, um, and the symptoms were just discharges now again. If you look very carefully at the picture, you can see um, that little pustule there, another one there, just in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the lower half, in the lower third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. There most likely would be a connection into the piriform fossa. Um, and the symptom most of the time would be that this just discharges now and again. This was in Liberia. There is no ENT surgeon in Liberia. They're going to get their first one probably towards the end of the year. There's somebody training in Malawi, who's going to go back there. My advice was simply here, just leave it alone. If it gets an upper respiratory tract infection, get your antibiotics in as quickly as possible. Um, I wouldn't rush to do anything um, about this. You got branchial cysts, completely different. They're also um, congenital, but you would find them in the upper part of the neck, laterally. Um, in the upper third, just in front of your stenocleidomastoid muscle. Once again, an ultrasound scan will be absolutely spot on in um, identifying these. And then you get hemangiomas and vascular malformations, not very common. This is a cystic hygroma several years ago, probably 10 years ago in, in Liberia. Um, very, very painstaking operation to do. Um, risk of cranial nerve neuropathy. As you can see, she's got a slight facial nerve weakness on that side. This is about three days after surgery, but this completely recovered about six months afterwards. Um, and so lastly on neck lumps, the aim is to define the lump um, and treat it, not just to make the lump go away. So I think the first question you want to ask, answer most of the time is what is it? Is it inflamed? Does it require acute treatment or is it something that can just wait or leave, be left alone? And then a definitive assessment to find out exactly um, what the lump is. And like I said, ultrasonography is pretty good most of the time um, with these lumps. Then I don't know, something in my, no, that's never gonna move. So I should take that off. There we go, recurrent tonsillitis, not uncommon. Um, few things, the tonsil size is of no importance if the patient doesn't have any symptoms. Although I acknowledge that many times they will have symptoms, but if they're absolutely fine, they don't have any symptoms, they're not snoring, they don't have anything subject to suggest obstructive sleep apnea, then they can simply be left alone. Tonsil asymmetry, once again, in the absence of any symptoms, is usually inconsequential, probably in older people, yes. So we've got the sign criteria in the UK, um, which I presume is something that you use in Nigeria too. And to, to be fair, it's the primary care physician or the pediatrician that sees the child that decides, one, is this recurrent tonsillitis? And two, how frequently is it happening? And so what we do is um, we would suggest a tonsillectomy if they're getting it seven times a year or for four, five times a year, two years in a row, um, or three times a year for three years in a row. Now, these are guidelines, not rules. Um, and the big thing here is sitting down with patients and to talk them through. Now, I, I completely understand that in your climb, many people do not like surgery for many reasons. Um, probably because of the concern about mobility, probably because of cost and things like that. And this is sitting down with patients to really discuss things with them. Recurrent tonsillitis would eventually burn out. And it's sitting down explaining to them that this is going to burn out. But of course, if it's causing problems with school attendance, if it's affecting their school performance, then yes, they probably do want to do something about it. In ENT surgery, we seldom do throat swabs because they're usually of very little benefit. And we're beginning to get a few more indications for tonsillectomy, apart from obstructive sleep apnea, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, 
choking particularly when eating. So you've got children who've got massively big tonsils, uh, what I describe as grade four, i.e. tonsils that are meeting in the midline. And literally when they're eating, they're choking, uh, which is a big problem. And that's becoming increasingly becoming um, an indication for um, selectomy in children. Come, the other thing that you would see a lot is obstructive sleep apnea, which I know that you is very pretty common. And I stumbled across this paper, uh, which was looked into the awareness of OSA among primary care physicians. So this is just all physicians. Uh, and they looked at South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria. Um, Investigations are of little value in this condition. This is a clinical diagnosis and investigations seldom change what we do. Now I know a lot of the time, so here, for example, a lot of people would do what we call overnight oximetry. It's helpful if it says the child has got obstructive sleep apnea. If it says there's no OSA, there is a high false negative rate. And so we're very cautious about doing it. And one of the things that we've done in Chesterfield is trying to cut down the number of these invest the overnight oximetries that we do when trying to make the diagnosis in clinic. Now, polysomnography is fantastic. It's great, but it's resource intensive and not always very available. Lateral cervical x-rays is another thing. Um, that I know is commonly done. In, and in looking at that paper there, it's one thing that's commonly done in um, Nigeria. But once again, the question I ask is, if you've got a child in front of you that has got all the symptoms and signs of obstructive sleep apnea, which I would show you in my second slide, but the lateral cervical x-ray suggests that the adenoids are probably minimal or um, moderate, would we not want to do something about it? Um, so once again, lateral cervical x-rays, we used to do them several years ago, um, but we don't anymore. We try to make this diagnosis clinically. As you know, this is a common cause, um, or the commonest cause in pediatrics is going to be adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Um, it's important to sit down and discuss morbidity with, patient, with the parent, and I'll show you my slide on that now. So you've got the symptoms there, um, snoring. Um, pauses when they're breathing more, for more than 10 seconds. And I'm sure you must be getting patients who actually come in with videos lasting two, three, four, five minutes long and say, doc, this is what happens when my child is asleep. The one, one question I ask them is, when you put your child down, do they sleep nicely and comfortably or are they all over the whole place? If they're all over the whole place, there's a good chance that they're struggling to get oxygen in, and that's why they're completely all over the whole place. Are they snorting? Are they coughing and choking? Do they mouth breathe in the week during the daytime? Uh, and are they sweating because they're, you know, literally spending more energy rather than sleeping nicely and quietly? Bed wetting is a very interesting one because you'll find that in children who have previously been dry, and all of a sudden they start wetting their beds. Um, that's, you know, that it can be a pointer. Um, you get patients, usually in adults, um, you would get daytime sleepiness a lot of the time with people who've got obstructive sleep apnea. But for children, you either get that or hyperactivity. They may have a poor academic performance or sometimes their attention span is quite poor. Signs, large tonsils, there's a reduced demisting pattern. And you can all, all you need for that is a cold spatula test. Um, if you get a metallic spatula or anything at all, even a spoon or anything, if you leave it in a fridge, put it under the child's um, nose, um, and you would find that the amount of moisture that you get on that spoon or knife or whatever it is, as long as it's a metallic, is not as much as you would expect it to be, just because there's not a very good air entry coming out of the nose. Morbidity, this is what you really want to sit down and discuss with parents, because many times parents may feel, well, I don't think this is a big issue, but it can be. And we know, and I'm sure you know probably more than I do about the cardiorespiratory problems, you know, pulmonary edema, hypertension in very, very extreme circumstances. Um, but you know, they can get failure to thrive. You know, they may have hyperplasia of the mid face. The reason why they have trouble breathing, um, sorry, trouble growing somewhere time, a lot of the time, is as you know, the growth hormone is actually 
secreted a lot while patient or while children are sleeping. And if you're not sleeping properly, the ability to secrete that hormone is not as good as it should be. And that's why they may not develop to their full potential the way they should. They get the neuropsychological deficits. You get children who are just not with it. You may be quite um, troublesome, maybe quite um, not, just not behaving as, as they ought to and it's I think it's so important to sit down with parents and discuss these mobility issues with them and tell them it really makes a big difference if they, they have surgery surgery is adenotonsillectomy just not tonsillectomy but the adenoids and tonsils um, usually need to be removed at the same time I acknowledge that there are quite a number of things that you could do to buy time you know nasal decongestants but you don't want to use them for too long you can also use things like saline nasal drops that does help to blow their nose and I'll talk a little bit more about nasal obstruction um, in a minute, but it's so important to sit down and talk with patients about the or parents, the parents of patients about these morbidity that comes with obstructive sleep apnea. I think over to ear complaints, um, acute otitis media. You are probably well versed with, in this than I am. Um, otitis media with a fissure may not be as common. Um, in West Africa, as it is, um, hair, it's a pretty big part of what we deal with in children hair. And one thing I just want to mention here, which I'm sure you're aware of, is that a lot of the time this condition is self-limiting. It causes hearing loss, but it's self-limiting. Um, the autovent device, I'm not sure how many people are aware of it, and I've got a video which I will try and play, and I hope it plays. Um, but it's so important, particularly um, in any society where resources may be limited, where parents may not be able to afford surgery. The autovent device makes a very big difference, and I'll show you a video about that in a minute. Surgery is very effective. Adenoidectomy and grommets, very effective. There's no question about that. Um, Recording to Titus Media, you've got the two types with or without cholecytoma. And I would show you some otoscopy pictures in a minute because picking up a cholecytoma is absolutely so important. Um, it's classically a foul smelling air discharge that doesn't get better. Um, don't forget air discharge is best treated with topical antibiotics, topical antibiotics, oral antibiotics usually not usually a waste of time, topical antibiotics. If there's so much discharge, try and do oral toilet. You don't really necessarily have to have a microscope or a suction. The parents can do it themselves. They can, all they need to do is get something and put a cotton bud on it and just clean out the stuff that comes in. They don't need to go into the air canal, just clean what's outside and then use topical antibiotic drops. So once again, cholecytoma, it's um, a foul smelling air discharge. Um, for the Otitis made up with a fusion, like I said, I hope this plays, and we'll see. But just wait for that. So it's it, it's referred to as the air popper. Um, and I just is still streaming. Nasal balloon autoinflation is the technique of ventilating the middle ear via the eustachian tube using a purpose manufactured balloon. Inflating the balloon via the nose increases the pressure in the nasopharynx and opens the eustachian tubes, equalising the middle ear pressures. This promotes drainage of middle ear effusions. Today we're going to try the nasal balloon to help you with your glue ear. The nasal balloon must be pre-stretched by hand or mouth inflation and then attached to a connecting nozzle. So when you're ready, if you look at the end of the nozzle, the nozzle is then held up to one nostril and the other nostril is closed off. The balloon is steadily inflated to about the size of a large orange. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Brilliant. Some children might take a few attempts, but most children can manage it with some practice. So, yes. And now this costs probably somewhere in the region of about um, 14, 15 pounds. But essentially, it's just a balloon with something connected to it. And if you get the real thing, I, I, you know, they're very, there are lots of very innovative people in, in Nigeria. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody could make um, a 
local one that would be significantly um, cheaper. But this is something that's very, very, very helpful for patients with otitis media with effusion. You, all you need to do is get the child to do it about three or four times a day or as many times as they possibly can a day. And it does make a big difference and can avoid surgery a lot of the time. So I've got some pictures here and this is an ear um, and you can see there's a significant amount of crust um, in what we call the attic. And the aim is to get rid of this crust because you don't know what's going on behind there. I can see that there is a little bit of a retraction there. Um, what would I do if I saw this in a child where you probably would not, so if it was an adult, we'll be able to just clean them out under the microscope. In a child, I would simply, simply give them sodium bicarbonate airdrops or any serolimitic airdrops that you have, anything that deals with wax, anything that is locally available for a week, that usually will get rid of this and you can see what's going on there. Um, if you get a retraction, a traction is a socked in part of the eardrum. Um, as long as, if you can see the whole extent of the retraction, you're fine. If you can't, I think they're best referred to an ENT surgeon. Another picture, this is a badly retracted eardrum, a bit of trauma there, probably if it's just in being cleaned. There are no ossicles to be seen. Um, you have no idea what's going on behind there. Um, and particularly if a child like this has an ear discharge, once again, they're best um, um, referred. Um, to an ENT surgeon. How do I know this is retracted and not a perforation? Um, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to tell, but I think if it was a real life, you would see that the eardrum is what we call atrophic. So it's thin and it's plastered onto the middle ear structures rather than a big perforation. And I'll show you one of those in a minute. So that's what we're doing by carbonate eardrops. There are loads and loads and loads of alternatives. Um, if worse comes to the worst, I mean, they really can't get any. Olive oils are equally good, but it doesn't work as fast um, as sodium bicarbonate airdrops or any other. But it's, it's, it's pretty important to just get stuff, get rid of wax when you can't look into the ear. It's another ear. Once again, you've got this discharge here. You may just want to use antibiotic airdrops here. And remember what I said about antibiotics, topical antibiotics, topical antibiotics, topical antibiotics. I'll probably try and go through the, another one here. Once again, attic. So the attic is just like the attic of a house. Um, and you can see it there between 11 and 1, p, 1 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. You know, this need, you need to get rid of this. Um, you need to find out what exactly. And so give them something to just get rid of this. You probably won't be able to clean this out in clinic. Um, and once again, like I said, sodium bicarbonate airdrops would be very helpful here. This is another picture. And you can see here, uh, you've got the um, uh, handle of the malleus, a little bit of it coming down there. Um, and this is a perforation there. You can see, if you if you look closely at this, it, it look, you, could, it, you can see the milieu structures. There's a big tympanosclerotic plaque here. That's probably from recurrent infections or something. And you can see the analysis of the eardrum there. Another one, so once again, if you compare this one to the former one, um, you, some people might say it's perforated, but it's not perforated. You can see there's some tympanous sclerosis there, and you can see that there's a thin eardrum through which you can see all the middle ear structures. You can see the long process, the handle of the malleus. You can see the long process of the incus there. And just interestingly there, you can actually see the corda tympani. Um, so, you know, sometimes you can see quite a lot just by doing otoscopy. Another picture, another um, atrophic eardrum. And um, you can see there's a light reflex there. So it's not perforated. Once again, you can see the long process of the incus. You can see the head of the stape is there um, and the handle of the malleus coming down here. Bit of tympanosclerosis there. Um, um, once again, this is a badly retracted eardrum. If there are no symptoms, absolutely fine to leave alone. Um, but if there's a discharge with this one, best refer to an ENT surgeon to find out and make sure they don't have a cholestomy. Because what you don't know is, is there something lurking at the back there, which could be a cholestomy. But this looks pretty okay, and it's just like a retracted eardrum. Of course, their hearing is going to be quite poor, um, and so they probably might need a hearing test and might. Um, uh, but some a lot of people will put grommets in a child like this, but once again, the autovent may may help to reinflate the middle ear cleft here, because that's what you want to do to reinflate the middle ear cleft. Um, otitis media with effusion, a dull eardrum, the attic there is slightly retracted, uh, handle of the malleus coming down there, but once again you can see that there's a lot of fluid there, so this child would also have a hearing loss.
um, perforated eardrum, um, you can't see any ossicles, um, and there's a large big perforation there. Um, don't forget, if you've got an asymptomatic perforation that's not causing any problems, all we need to do is tell these patients, keep your ears dry. How can they keep their ears dry? They can use swimming modes or um, just some cotton wool smeared with Vaseline will stop water from getting in. Uh, my last trip to Liberia, I found quite a number of children who had perforated eardrums. There's no ENT surgeon there. I said, surgery is not, and even if I said surgery, they probably won't afford it. Do everything possible to make sure that you don't get water into your ear. So cotton wool smeared with Vaseline usually does a very good job here. Nosebleeds. Um, most idiopathic. Um, one thing I would say, particularly in the teenage children, um, is trying to exclude an obstructive cause. And it's very basic. It's simply asking one basic question. Before these nosebleeds started, does your child or has your child ever complained of a blocked nose? And if they have complained of a blocked nose, particularly on one side, and they're bleeding from that one side, I think you should just make sure that somebody has a look all the way to the back. I'll be talking about nasal endoscopy in a few minutes. I hope I can because I can see the time is 3.41. Um, so first aid, nasal cautery, uh, naseptin, bactroban. But if you can't get all these posh antibiotic ointments, just simple Vaseline is pretty good. I think one important thing is how you apply it. Many people will get the Vaseline. Some people use a cotton bud. I say, no, don't use a cotton bud because what they do is they try and shove it up into the nose and that's gonna cause more trauma. Some people use their fingertip. Once again, I say, no, don't do that. So put the Vaseline on your knuckle and use your knuckle to apply it to the nose on both sides and ask the child to sniff it up as hard as they possibly can. That usually gets it all the way up into the nose. Um, it smears the nasal cavity very nicely. It stops the crusting and reduces the chance of further um, nosebleeds. Um, this is my um, daughter, by the way, um, just coming up into our room at one o'clock one day in the morning with a bad nosebleed like this. Uh, so epistaxis, again, this is what you need. You need a 30 com speculum. You need a headlight. Um, if you don't have lidocaine in, in hydrochloride, simple, simple adrenaline is absolutely fine, or even just the nasal decongestant. But if you get adrenaline, you got more space. You need some cotton wool and you need silver nitrate sticks um, to do with epistaxis. Um, the nasal obstruction, once again, very, very common. Um, enlarged adenoids, a common cause. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, rhinitis would either be allergic or non-allergic. And one of the big things about allergic about rhinitis generally is patient education. And you can see I've put it in bold and made it bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is simply because, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, patients go from one doctor to another doctor to another doctor looking for a cure. There is no cure for allergic rhinitis. What I tell patients, it is like being hypertensive or diabetic or asthmatic. There isn't a cure, there's control. You can control these conditions such that you have a very good quality of life. And it's control, 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 allergen avoidance, antihistamines, and topical steroid preparations. And I talk about the step ladder approach. So allergen avoidance first. And some people with just allergen avoidance, avoiding the things that they're allergic to, that solves their problem. If that doesn't work, you then go to allergen avoidance and antihistamines. And don't forget, we've got the sedating, on, the sedating antihistamines and the non-sedating antihistamines. I don't see any reason to use sedating antihistamines like Puritan. Um, you've got cetirizine. You've got, there's another one, there's fexofenadine. And these are pretty good um, and they don't cause sedation. They do cause sedation in a few people, but very, very rarely. If allergen avoidance and antihistamines don't work, then the next step is allergen avoidance, antihistamines, and topical nasal sprays. Let's be very careful, your pediatricians, I'm sure you're aware and you're very conscious of the fact that topical nasal sprays used on a long-term basis can lead to a lot of steroids being absorbed. Nasonex, which is mometanzone, is proven to be very safe in children, but once again, they can be titrated. So you might just say use it once a day or twice a day. It depends on the dose that actually controls the symptoms. And this usually helps to control most patients. If you're struggling, don't forget, you know, there are people who have expertise in um, or dual in, 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 in allergy um, conditions, particularly um, in children. 
um, I'm well aware um, that Dr. Rushote, who I've not seen on the line, but he may well be now, um, is um, this is one of his areas of expertise. You know, think about referring patients to people like uh, people like that. Surgery is relevant, but don't forget. Let's tell our patients that surgery is not going to cut cure your condition. So turbinate reduction surgery is very helpful. And all it does, it helps your topical sprays to go in better. It doesn't control, it doesn't cure the condition. Um, septal surgery is appropriate in children, although the older the child is, the better. The other things we need to tell these patients, I'm sure you're well aware of this, is their nose blowing techniques. And I think above the age of four, five, six, we can begin to teach children how to blow their nose properly. Um, it's just to get rid of normal nasal secretions. Polyps, um, if patients have got polyps, they definitely need to be seen by an ENT surgeon because you just want to be sure that they don't have um, any other systemic conditions like cystic fibrosis, or that this is probably not just something even in the intracranial region coming up into the nose. So very important that we refer patients who've got nasal polyps, if you see anything like that, um, to your ENT surgeons. And the other thing about nasal obstruction, you know, and large adenoids, this is a self-limiting condition. It gets better over time as the child gets better. Um, and that's why I talk about the natural history there. So is it really necessary to treat these things? Um, snoring. If there's no sleep apnea, snoring is a social condition. And I tell patients that, you know, do you want to put your child through an operation just because they snore if they don't have sleep apnea? Um, apneic episodes, yes, would suggest that they have sleep apnea or failure to thrive. So it's just thinking about, you know, is treatment truly really necessary? And there are loads of things that you can you give these children. You can give them saline nasal, nasal drops. They do help significantly because they can help to loosen secretions and help the child to blow their nose properly. Um, steroid nasal sprays, um, yes, helpful, but you know, let's just be a little bit careful on how we give these things, um, particularly if they've got conditions that are um, self-limiting. So airway problems, epiglottitis, I don't know whether it's common, it's become less common um, in the UK because of the HIV um, immunization. Um, You've got acute LTB in the younger child. Um, it's usually a biphasic strider. Foreign body is probably a bit more straightforward because the history will be a bit more acute. Although don't forget, sometimes you might get children who've inhaled a foreign body and they've had repeated chest infections over time. Um, sometimes you may just need to repeat, you know, go through the history very carefully um, to pick things out. A chest x-ray many times will give the story away many times here because you might get um, long chairs on specifically just one side. Um, airway problems, this is a very commonly quoted paper that of um, diagnosis at Great Ormond Street um, in, um, in London. Now, I appreciate that you may not see a lot of these things, but I guess that it's mainly because we're not looking for them. Um, Laryngomalacia is not as uncommon as we think it's there. Um, I will show you a video of a child of a vocal cord palsy in Tamale in Ghana in a few minutes if I have time to do that. Subglottic hemangiomas, you would find them in children and one of the telltale signs is that they'll probably have hemangiomas on other parts of the body and um, they usually get worse and then get better over time. Subglottic stenosis, the commonest cause of this hair is interventions. These are children who have been um, intubated several times and then get subglottic stem st um, um, stenosis. I'm not sure how common respiratory papillomatosis is, but these are the big things here. Do they have feeding difficulties, failure to thrive, cyanosis, apneic spells, or recurring chest infections? And these are your big markers to decide whether you're going to do anything about these conditions or not. I am aware that probably most of time, because we can't treat these things definitely, we, um, a lot of these children may end up with tracheostomies, which they have to use for quite some time until they get a bit older. And um, pediatrics, this is one of the things I want to, um, and I will, so this is in Somali, you can see this child um, is very well. Okay. Okay. And this child had multiple pathology and a bit of laryngomalacia and, and um, congenital bilateral vocal cord palsy. The reason why I show this is once again to lies with your ENT surgeons. I've spoken to a lot of ENT surgeons in my journey North Africa, and I think nasoendoscopy is not as common as I think it should be. And it's possible to do it in children, much younger children, so that we just do it through the mouth. 
This is their child, as you can see. Another child is crying, um, but that's because we didn't have a proper kinesthetic. If you look very carefully, you would see an omega shape um, epiglottis. So very poor view of the cord. Now, do you have uh, do you have a glottis? Do you have an opening? Do you have there is bite? An opening. You sure? Do you see vocal cord motion? Second thing, very very subtle, is a the lack bit. of vocal cord movement. But so they very just stay there and just keep very unusual in a child that has a very I don't see much like of an opening. So the main Maybe thing here was the. Um, Malaysia. I'll stop that because it's a pretty long video. Okay. Now, nice paper that was done in JOS. Um, and like I said, I, I think a lot of the airway problems that are not diagnosed, I think it's mainly because we may not be looking for them. Um, but a lot of the airway or a lot of the emergencies are acute pharyngeal tonsillitis, foreign bodies. Those are a lot of what we're seeing in ENT um, in the West African subregion. A few resources. I don't know how many people are aware of Pent Africa. Um, they held their first um conference um, in Zimbabwe in 2018. They were supposed to hold another one in Kenya in 2020, but for obvious reasons, the pandemic, they didn't. Um, it's simply pediatricentafrica.com. It's a very great resource. Um, I would encourage everybody to go there. It's interesting. If you can get to one of their meetings, um, pretty good. In October 2018, they've really pushed things and they were actually able to have a panel on pediatric airway services um, in limited resource um, settings. Um, Wally Gilo is um, um, the first Carl Stotts Pediatric ENT Fellow um, who has finished and gone back to and uh, gone back to Ethiopia, and um, so it's it's a pretty you know pretty good you know resource that what these guys are doing. It's one of the um, surgeons in um, Zimbabwe, one of the ENT surgeons in Zamb Zimbabwe that started this, and it's now been it's now doing pretty well with them. So they have their meetings I think every two years, but it's worthwhile just looking at their website to see what's what these guys are doing. In conclusion, what would I say my top tips are? I would say try and build teams and relationships. I was talking about ultrasonography, try and speak with your ENT surgeons. We can, there's a little bit more that we can do. Um, and I talked about core needle biopsies. Communication, talking to our patients is so, so, so important. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that you know this better than I do as pediatricians. Um, when I was in school, you know, we were taught that, you know, listen to the mother, listen to the mother. And I'm sure it's still the same thing. So try and build teams, try, you know, a bit more lateral thinking, communication with patients, explaining things to them as much as possible. Um, essentially, those will be my top tips. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, um, thank you very much, Wally. Not only have you delivered on that, but also given the time allocation, I think you did fit that in quite snugly. Um, I particularly like the way that you started off in addressing, and I think that's been the theme for your presentation, that um, common things do occur commonly, and that on that basis, um, having um, a, a good grounding in terms of um, what are those things in terms of lymph nodes and um, tonsillitis, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, issues of acute otitis media with and without occlusion, um, the recurrent ones, and um, I also like the, the, the way that you did advise that a lot of the conditions um, can resolve with a bit of patience and watchful waiting uh, before there's an over-enthusiasm regarding jumping into surgery. Um, one of the things about ENT, um, within the limited uh, knowledge and exposure that I've had to it, there are either bits to it that can be very simple and easily managed uh, right from the primary care level with general practitioners through to the highly specialist work that um, that, that, that you guys do within your um, service. Now, just a, 
there was one of the things that you said during the course of the discussion um, regarding a term polysomnography. Now, I'm familiar with that from this end. Um, do, you, do you want to just explain it for the wider audience where people might have um, either not have access to it or not use it in their regular practice? So great. You've, oops, am I, am I still on? Yes. I'm, so you've got the pulse oximetry that just has a pulse oximetry on the, on the child. They go to sleep with that. You, If you just Google that, you can get, there's quite a number of places where you can get that. The polysomnography is a much more complex one. It's done in hospital. There are, you know, lots of things connected up to the child. Um, there's the pulse oximetry, there's the heart rate, the blood pressure, the chest movements, the sound movements, a lot of things. Like I said, it's resource intensive. It's very good. It's the gold standard. It's very good. But like I said, it's, it's, um, it's resource intensive. And that's probably why a lot of people would not have access to it. So even in the UK, a lot of us don't have access um, um, to this. Thanks so much. Now, one of the other take home messages that, um, you know, which you emphasized repeatedly was uh, the importance of topical uh, treatment in the case of uh, children and young people who have got uh, some of the more inflammatory or infective pathologies to their ears. Um, because the common theme where people aren't aware of that is to go for the more systemic um, uh, antibiotics, which, you know, you did allude to that uh, a, a few times. Now, the one of the other take home messages which was um, something that was really useful. When people are doing surgical specialties, everyone's talked about when you have when, when there are lumps and bumps, about not just the good history and being aware of the wellness or of systemic symptoms, but the good description, including uh, and particularly for the issue of the cervical lymphadenopathy, the sight, the size, the consistency, the tenderness, the mobility. You know, all of those things. And I think we have to bring all of that back into our everyday practice in terms of when we do feel things that are lumps or bumps anywhere at all. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat at the moment, and I think we've started to have a little bit of movement on there. So let's see what we've got. Um, so there is a question that... Um, uh, now it's, it's moving. Um, so this question that says, can we use hydrogen peroxide where sodium um, bicarbonate solution is not available? I don't think that hydrogen peroxide um, would be a good alternative, um, but there are loads of others that your average pharmacist, do. if you just get into any pharmacy, um, Lagos anywhere, they would they would have some local ones. I honestly can't even remember the ones, the other ones that we have in the UK, but they would have some other ones that they can use. If you're really, really struggling, olive oil is absolutely good. It's only that it takes time before it works. Um, so your, your pharmacists will be able to tell you what other alternatives they have. There'll be loads of alternatives. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. In, in response to the comment on polysomnography, um, Dr. Turati has mentioned that polysom polysomnography is available in Lagos, and uh, that's uh, very nice to know. Um, now, available is one thing. I think in the wider scheme of things, what we should be thinking about is accessibility. And with but we need to drive, um, or societies need to drive to make sure that things are available, but ultimately that every single member of society and community does have access to some of these um, investigatory uh, modalities and also for treatments. We'll take another of the questions. Um, do you recommend hearing tests after recurrent otitis media in the pediatric population? So how do I decide whether somebody needs a hearing test or not? One your pediatricians, you're absolutely good at deciding whether somebody's history is reliable or not. If you think a patient's parent's history is reliable and they say, my child is fine, they don't have a hearing loss, they're doing absolutely well in school, they don't have the TV loud, I don't do a hearing test. If the child's parents are raising concerns, I do a hearing test. 
Um, don't forget, um, in resource um, uh, low area, you can do a whisper test. Um, so they, if you stand behind a child so that they can't see you lip reading and put your finger on the triggers of one ear and whisper behind them at a distance of two feet, if they can hear that, then they've got good hearing. And you can do it for the other ear too. And it's very good with the mother or the father present because then they know that they can hear. So once again, if you just be, or you could just Google whisper test. So finger on the triggers to mask one ear, go behind the child so they can't lip read you and just whisper. It has to be bisyllable words. So you can just whisper things like um, Dr. West, Michael's iPad. You can just whisper bisyllable things. If they can hear you two feet behind you, they've probably got a good hearing. If it's an older child, there's some online hearing tests that you can do all for free. If it's a child that can afford a hearing test, by all means, you know, send them. Okay, so we've got from, um, we've got a question here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've found fluticasone nasal spray very helpful for children with severe rhinitis or nasal obstruction. That's the only steroid spray available in my environment and uh, I use it for short periods. Do you want to comment on that, please? Yeah, fluticasone is fine. Once again, I think you've said it all for short periods. The safest steroid nasal spray for children is mometasone. I'm not, and I may be wrong, I'm not aware of any studies that have been done for fluticasone. Um, but yes, short periods, and short periods means probably no more than four to six weeks, but not for long. But things like mometasone, which is nasonex, you can use that on a long-term basis. Uh, Thank you. We'll, we'll um, just try to we'll try and cover as many of the questions as possible within our time allocation. So um, another excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, and say so any comments on nasal gouging in management of allergic rhinitis? Oh, that fantastic question. I completely forgot about that. That is absolutely brilliant. It's something that we're now aware of in the last 10, 15 years. Nasal dowsing, very, very, very helpful. Thank you for that person who added that in. It's fantastic. So before you use your nasal sprays or anything, clean out the nose. It just washes out the nose with, and just saline is absolutely fine. You don't need to get any of these posh things. If you can afford the posh things, that's fine. But saline douche to just wash out the nose, washes out all the allergens and then use your nasal spray. Yes, thank you very much for that. That's yeah, very good. So um, we've been supplied with uh, um, with the phone contact details for the for, for sleep um, um, service, and perhaps that might link them with the polysomnography. Now, there's another question that says, can you re-emphasize the use of topical antibiotics in treatment of otitis media? Yes, can I just clarify, because I can see that's another question there. I'm talking of otitis, a discharging otitis media. So I'm not talking of otitis media in somebody who has an intact tympanic membrane. Um, once again, you guys are very good at knowing whether antibiotics are required or not. We know that a lot of those conditions are viral, um, but I leave it to you to decide whether you want to use antibiotics. So I'm talking about a discharging air. That's what I mean by otitis, acute otitis media, when you have a discharging air. When you've got a discharging air, topical antibiotic drops, please. If it's just an intact air drop, yes, oral antibiotics, if you think that is, um, if you think that that's appropriate, yeah. So I just thought I should clarify that because I can see somebody said, and I disagree with the use of topical antibiotic drops. So if you just got a, acute otitis media with an intact air drop, yes, you're right. Um, we don't need topical antibiotic drops for that. Okay. Uh, Very nice question there on flying for children with recurrent otitis media. This is what I tell patients. Number one, I would say use a decongestant nose drop, nose drop um, one hour before you fly and one hour before the descent of the flight. So, um, probably about two or three drops on each side and um, in the head down position. And that helps um, to decongest the postnatal space. The other thing is once the plane starts ascending, make sure the child is either chewing gum or chewing a sweet or sucking on a sweet or something like that. So drain the process, so just make sure that they're swallowing constantly and they're doing exactly the same thing when the plane's coming down again. And that's usually quite helpful um, for a lot of people with these station two problems. 
thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Grange, for that question. Um, relevant to high flyers and um, people who do have the ability to do the travels. Um, but again, I do agree that that is a fantastic question. Um, okay, we're, we're drying up on questions now. Um, do we have any um, questions that I've missed out um, as you were scrolling through, Wally? Is there anything that's um, is striking that you've seen that I haven't picked up on? Yeah, so somebody has asked, um, how useful is zytometalazone? It's useful, but don't forget, don't use it for too long. Um, so if you've got a child, for example, that's got a bad cold and probably they need to participate in a child in a school play or something or whatever, they need to get rid of their symptoms very quickly. It's absolutely fine to use. I think it comes to the same question again. You know, it's, there's nothing like talking to patients. You know, it's like the recurrent colds and upper respiratory tract infections that children get. I tell patients, your child does need to get colds and recurring tract infections. That is how they develop immunity. So it's talking and talking because many parents give, seem to give the impression, I do not want him to get any colds at all. Um, so yeah, xylometalazone is absolutely fine as long as you're not overusing it. Um, you'll get patient parents who come and say, oh yeah, but when we use it all the time, it's absolutely fine. Let them be aware of the rebound rhinitis, rhinitis medicamentosa. It's a reality and it does cause problems. Okay, we've got another um, uh, question and comment uh, from Professor Grange regarding um, uh, team building and working together as broader specialties, not just medical, but also nurses, um, towards facilitating improved um, healthcare for our children, and with particular mention um, to ENT specialist nurses. You want to comment on that, please? Yes, so there are, um, and I'm sure Dr. Erinde would know this, that there are, the pediatric services are not just um, some little service anymore. So for example, in my hospital, we would not just mix, we don't mix clinics, for example, anymore. Um, it, it's, it's a real niche area now and there are ENT specialist nurses. Um, I am sure that with a bit of push, um, we can get talks organized, something similar to what we're doing with a pediatric nurse um, who would be able to understand the setting in which you work. Um, I think one of the good things that COVID has taught us is that we can have a lot of these meetings um, um, remotely. So yes, it's an area that can be explored and I'm sure I can, uh, probably out of this, out of this uh, meeting, I'm sure I can probably source some pedi ENT pediatric nurses who will be more than happy to um, discuss specific things because you're absolutely right and um, struggling children, pacifying children, how to get through some of these things um, is quite helpful. So yes, I think out of this, I'll be more than happy to help with this to source some pediatric um, nurses um, who would be quite helpful in this area. Now, um, a lot of time when people fly, you, um, when the um, plane's about to take off or on um, descent, you see people sharing either sweets or mint or gum and so on. Um, I see that um, uh, already has put a comment there regarding um, this in addition to the nasal decongestants around the time of flood. Now, do you want to comment on the benefits of um, the sweets and all that we take yep. with uh, good intention and yeah, over to you. Yeah, definitely good. <laughs> it's, um, um, some people don't have a prolonged rotation to problems, so they don't need it. But for yes, for people who do, and um, because they can actually cause problems, you know, we, we it's not infrequently that we get people who have flown, and after flying they've got a blocked you know, the blocked air, and um, which you know they, they've either got a negative pressure that just never goes away. So it, it's it's not a bad practice. It doesn't have to be done routinely. I think it's only indicated in patients who are. Um, who have established stage two problems when they're flying. Um, otherwise, I think there's no need to do anything if you don't have any problems in that respect. Uh, can, I, can I take the liberty to ask you another question, please? So, 
Um, one of the things that perhaps we haven't um, delved into very much, and we do see certainly quite a fair bit of it over here, um, perhaps less so when I was uh, practicing in Nigeria, although time has since uh, lapsed since that time, um, is the whole theme of um, the uh, sinuses and also the interplay between that and things like the uh, orbital and periorbital cellulitis or the septal, preceptal, and the interplay between the ENT specialist and the ophthalmology specialist um, in the management, management of that and preventing complications. Yes. Uh, before I go to that, somebody has just thrown in a fantastic comment there. Also, smaller babies can be put to the breast during ascent and descent. Fantastic, you know, brilliant, brilliant idea. Yes, I, I, love, I love that. Anyway, so coming to periop to pre preceptal, postceptal cellulitis, I don't know how common this is in West Africa, Nigeria. It is not an uncommon condition in the UK. It is of great concern, particularly when it's not managed properly. And I would say just one or two th key things about it. Number one, joint care. So no ENT surgeon, no pediatric pediatrician, no ophthalmologist should manage these on their own. There should be joint care. And I'll quickly explain why. Pediatricians are the best doctors to deal with children. ENT surgeons are best to know when surgery is indicated or not. And ophthalmologists are the best people to assess the eye function. It's as straightforward as that. Um, no matter how much pediatric surgery I do, an average pediatrician is much better at dealing with children than I do. Joint care, very important. Number two is knowing when surgery is indicated. And it is very important not to be rushing these children off for CT scans so quickly. What are the indications for surgery? Number one, if you can't assess the eye function. Number two, if you've got significant chemosis, that's swelling of the conjunctiva. Number three, where there's been no change after 24 to 48 hours of antibiotics. Four, if there's significantly reduced eye movements. Five, if you've got intracerebral, intracerebral signs or symptoms. So a child who comes in confused, for example, you don't need to waste time looking at their eye function, they go off for a CT scan. It's very important when you're sending them for a CT scan that the person who's in the CT scan knows what you are looking for. One, are there any intracerebral complications? Two, is there an abscess to be drained? The CT scan has to be done with contrast and they specifically need to be answering that question. A lot of these patients may be treated surgically, endoscopically here, um, but that's not necessary. They can be done with an outside incision. Um, and it's very important. We have seen people go blind from the condition. So my take home message with this is number one, joint care. Number two, getting on top of it in time and getting the appropriate investigations. Before I rush into the CT scans and all of that stuff, because people may not have access to it, is looking into the nose. Is there a pus coming out? Take a swab. Um, antibiotics, triple antibiotics, kefatoxin, um, um, Coamoxiclav, very important. And then the decongestant nose drops, also very important because this helps to open up the sinuses and let the pus come out. So that's probably what I would say about um, preceptal cellulitis, um, per per periorbital cellulitis. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll take the final question now, um, which is uh, one from Dr. Onifadi, um, which does say there that. Um, organomegaly is pretty common in our environment. Uh, I, I get a bit confused when uh, it, it's Dr. Unifade because uh, in terms of the environment in which she works or operates, it, it, it's hard to tell whether she's in the UK or whether she's in Nigeria at any point in time. Uh, and um, every now and again, you do call her and she's in the States, but she's a practicing clinician in Nigeria and in the UK. So the question is, Organomegaly is pretty common in our environment. How do you reassure yourself and the parent that a gland is not sinister? I think a lot of it centers around 
um, history examination here. So a lot of the organomegaly that we're going to get um, in West Africa, um, sickle cell disease. Um, I think the general health of the child is a big one. If there's associate, if the, if the general generally by and large, and I think this is me straying a little bit here because I can't remember when last I touched a child's abdomen. Um, so this is me straying a little bit here, but I would think that the general health of a child if a child is on the whole well without any problems, their organomegaly is probably of little concern. Uh, but I, I think I should leave that to, to a pediatrician to decide about that. Actually, I, I can't remember when last I've touched a child's abdomen, I must be honest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and on that note, I'm sure you'd all um, uh, wish to uh, congratulate and express our gratitude to uh, Mr. Wale Olarundi on a very well delivered um, uh, topic. There's uh, ENT as well as any other topic in uh, medicine, very broad fields. And I think he's done us great justice and covered a range of very important topical things that we can all transfer into our everyday practice. Uh, thank you very much, Wale. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Little. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kule. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to Wale for doing justice to the topic. Uh, I'm sure we've all learned a lot. And um, some of us might still consult you privately for other things concerning ENT. Uh, Kule, I want to thank you, especially because you were able to fish out Wale for us. And uh, I know that when next we call upon you to help us again, you will definitely do justice. Thank you very much. I'd like Dr. Orode to say the vote of thanks before I hand over to the chairman. Orode, are you online? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, so on behalf of the entire group of the um, pediatricians in private practice, I would like to thank very much Mr. Wale Olarengi for this really excellent, well-delivered talk. Um, it's not every day that we have the good fortune of having an ENT surgeon among us and doing this um, with such ease. It always makes it really easy. That tells you how much of an um, amazing surgeon you are. So thank you very much for pushing out your ENT colleague and I'm sure that you will push out another great team in our firm. Um, I'd like to also thank our seniors, uh, Professor Grange, Dr. Jennifer, Dr. Mugula Dilawa. Thank you, Prof. Who's, um, whenever we get together, you can tell the people who have uh, practiced long and hard among us because Prof's question opened up a a nice little box that sort of everybody worries about. When they when we're ascending and descending, what do you do with all these people? And we who have lived for long with them, you station two problems. Uh, that's why I wrote it down so that I would remember as well. Thank you very much, Ma. And to all our colleagues, thank you so much because without you, this would not be exciting. So I see that we have 27 people here. It means that we've touched 27 entire practices and ways of practice. And uh, thank you for coming. And I hope to see you all soon and to be much more present during these meetings. God bless everyone. Ashegon, over to you, sir. Thank you already. Um, and uh, keep up the good work that you're doing. Both of us understand ourselves, so don't worry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Dr. Mbolajilawa, your closing remarks. Well, uh, uh, thank you, everyone. An excellent day. Um, everybody has been thanked very well. Uh, the only person remaining to be thanked is Dr. Duarte for your excellent uh, wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Th th thank you very much, thank sir. You. Thank you. So, just to remind us that the next presentation will be on the 25th of August. And um, like the chairman said earlier, we'll be talking about equipment management which I'm sure quite a lot of us will uh, benefit from. Uh, we have the pleasure of uh, Dr. Amadi. Uh, some of us will have seen this, this CNN uh, documentary. So he's going to talk to us about equipment management. So we look forward to 
seeing you next month. And once again, to say a big thank you to Dr. Wale for creating time. I know you're a very busy man. Yesterday you were in theater till close to seven, eight o'clock and yet you are still able to do the simulation and then do an excellent presentation to us today. Thank you very, very much. Kule, we'll talk after this, of course, you know. Thank you and thank you so much to each and every one of us. So see you next month. Bye for now. Thanks, bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye everyone. Thank you very much. Everyone. Bye bye.